everyone, and welcome back to the series on financial mathematics. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of different interest rates and discuss quite a few different interest rate forms that you can use to price any financial product. I'm going to mainly describe the most common ones and also describe how they relate to each other and how you convert from one to another if interested. So let's just review one important concept and particular compounding interest rates that we discussed last time. And we said that at some time n, we can find how much is in the account if it compounds n times under some interest rate i via the principal rate multiplied by one plus the interest rate to the power of the number of compoundings. Now, the first type of interest rate form that we're going to discuss is this one plus i. So one plus i can also be represented by the letter alpha. So that's gonna be represented by alpha. And this is a type of interest rate form because i is an interest rate form, so one plus i should also be one. And this is commonly called, sometimes people will put the word periodic in front of it, but it's called the accumulation factor. Accumulation factor. So what exactly is an accumulation factor and what exactly does it do? So if we look at a basic financial product, and let's assume we're interested in going to time t is equal to one, one time. So we're going to do S0 plus S0 times our interest rate, right? So that's our principal plus the amount of interest that we accumulated. So that's gonna be equal to S0 times one plus i. But look at that, that one plus i, that's just equal to alpha. So that just converts S0 into S1. So it moves S0 one point into the future of our timeline. So if we look at, for example, S2, well, S0 is going to be equal to S1 times 1 plus i, but that's just the same as S1 times alpha, and S1 is the same as S0 times alpha, so that's S0 times alpha times alpha, which is just S0 times alpha 2. So what does alpha 2 do? Well, it moves S0 two places into the future of our timeline. So if you're really comfortable with timelines, for the majority of financial mathematics, you can usually analyze any financial product regardless of how complex it is. And accumulation factors are easy ways to move money into the future of a timeline. So if we have a timeline that starts at, for example, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And let's assume without loss of generality that this corresponds to one year, two year, three year, and four year. Then alpha is going to move money one place into the future. Alpha can move from one to two. Alpha can move from two to three. Alpha can move from three to four. But if you want to jump multiple positions, what you can do is you can exponentiate alpha to the power of the number of time steps you want to move into the future. So what does alpha do? Alpha accumulates S0 into the future by one time step. And usually time step is taken to be a year, right? So a very basic calculation, for example, if alpha is equal to 1.32, and keep in mind alpha is the same as one plus i, what is that interest rate or that annual interest rate? In this particular case, i will be equal to 1.32 minus one, which is just gonna be 0.32. So just some basic math there associated to that basic interest rate i and that accumulation factor alpha, right? So now let us look at Another example, just to make sure we understand this before we start mixing all of these things around. So let us suppose that I, and let's assume that this is a monthly, monthly interest rate is 0.65%, and keep in mind that's the same as 0.0065, then what would be our associated alpha? So alpha in this case is gonna be equal to 1.0065. Right? So if we have our S0, and let's assume that S0 is equal to 
$1,000. And let's assume that we want to compound this five years later under this monthly interest rate 0 0.0065. What would be our associated value at that particular time? So t is equal to five, where we're compounding monthly. So if we look at our particular timeline, what are we going to have here? So we have our S0, we have our S1, we have our S2, and we continue all the way down to S12, so that's going to be one year. But we want to go five years, so five times 12, that's going to be equal to 12, 24, 36, 48, 60. So that's going to go all the way down to 60. So an accumulation factor moves it one time step into the future, so that's going to be equal to alpha, 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 and then we're going to alpha that many, many times. So we want to move from S0 to S60 immediately, so that's going to be an alpha 60 accumulation factor. So what would that value be? So that means S60, which is going to be five years, is going to be equal to our initial principal times alpha to the power of 60, and that's going to come out to approximately $32,452.00. 60 cents, right? So what does alpha do? Have you figured it out yet? So alpha moves things forward in time. So a natural question you could ask, uh, how about backwards? How about backwards in time? So for example, if I want to accumulate uh, some particular principle into $32,000 under some accumulation factor value alpha of 1.0065, how much should that principle be, right? So how much should we initially invest if that's how much money we want after that particular period of time? So that's why we want to answer this particular question, how about backwards? So if S1 is equal to S0 times alpha, so this is going to move S0 one time step into the future to S1, how can we go from S1 to S0? So we can just divide both sides of this equation by alpha to get S0 by itself. So S0 will be equal to one over alpha times S1, right? So if we want to go, for example, S2, is equal to S0, well, that's two time steps forward in time since we're going from S0 to S2, and we want to get S0 by itself, so we're gonna divide both sides by alpha squared. That's gonna be equal to what? So that means S0 will be equal to one over alpha squared multiplied by S2. So you're like, okay, I'm starting to see a pattern now. So that means if Sn is equal to S0 times alpha to the power of n, that means S0 will be equal to 1 over alpha to the power of n multiplied by Sn, right? So we can, of course, rearrange this expression to you know, get a different um, interest rate structure because alpha is just going to be equal to what? Well, alpha is just going to be 1 plus i, and we can actually write this instead as 1 over alpha to the power of n times sn. We can also write this instead as 1 over 1 plus i to the power of n, sn, and now we have something that is exponentiated to the power of n, just like something, the alpha was exponentiated to the power of n when we were moving things forward in time. So this particular structure is what we're going to define. Some people will call it V, some people will call it Greek letter nu. Um, I'll probably interchangeably go between V and nu, um, but nu is gonna be equal to one over one plus I. And this is what we're going to call the periodic discount factor. Some people will say periodic in front of it, but nonetheless it is a discount factor. So it discounts it um, into the past, I guess you could say. So again, we could also say equivalently that nu is equal to one over alpha equivalently, right? So to sort of summarize what this new object is, so if Sn is equal to S0 times alpha to the power of n, and we want to go instead from S0 to Sn, instead we want to go from Sn to S0, so we're moving back in time, so this is future in time, and this is back in time. That means we need to discount it instead of accumulate it n times, so that's gonna be going to nu to the power of m, right? So if we look at a particular uh, example, 
let's assume that S0 is equal to 18,500, and let's assume that our base interest rate I is equal to 0 0.0045 again, or actually slightly different than before, then what are we going to have? So S0 is gonna be equal to one over one plus 0 0.0045 to the power of, actually let's assume that this is 20 and we want to go back to zero, right? So we have $18,500 in the future. How much is that worth in the present time? So that's gonna be equal to one over alpha or nu to the power of 20 times our S20. And once we actually work that out, that's gonna come out to approximately $16,000 $911.14, right? So keep in mind, every time you accumulate things into the future, it's always going to be more, assuming that that interest rate is, of course, positive. And if you want to discount things from the future to the past, um, your answer should always be less than it was before, right? So that's how we can uh, accumulate things into the future and discount things backward in time. Now let us go back to the idea of compounding interest because we have some interest rates that are usually framed from the perspective of years and then we're going to truncate them or partition them down into months or days or minutes or instances. So let's assume, for example, that we have an annual interest rate of 15.7 and we're going to be compounding this interest rate monthly. So the notation that we're going to be using for this 15.7% because 15.7% isn't actually the interest rate that we're going to be using directly in calculations. It's 15.7% divided by 12. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to denoting i to the power of 12 in parentheses to be equal to this 0 0.157. Right? So this particular object is going to be your nominal this is called our nominal, nominal interest rate. Nominal sometimes is used as annual, and this is gonna be convertible, in particular to the power of n, right? So I, m is the general notation. So we're gonna be compounding this n times in its period of a year, right? So a year partitioned into n, usually uniform pieces. So if we were to look at that from the compounding formula, so S12 months is gonna be equal to what? So that's gonna be equal to S0 times one plus I12 over 12 to the power of 12, and that's gonna be equal to S1, which is with respect to one year. So if we look at this particular formula from a timeline perspective, what do we have here? So we have our S0, and we also have our S12, and let's assume that this is in terms of months, which is equivalent to one year, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and then finally 12. So pretty much what we have here is we have uh, some accumulation, some accumulation, some accumulation, some accumulation, some accumulation, and so on. But this accumulation is with respect to this particular I-12 interest rate. But if we want to jump from here to here in one jump, where we have, for example, one plus I, because technically we're only going from S0 to S1, so that's one plus I to the power of one, where I is corresponding to some annual, so some annual, some people also call it an annual effective interest rate. What would be the relationship between this I-12 and the annual effective interest rate? Because it's very, very easy to accumulate into the future one year or a fraction of a year using this annual effective interest rate, which is why a lot of people usually use effective interest rates to price financial products. So if we look at this particular particular expression, in particular one plus i, so one plus i, and that's obviously gonna to be to the power of one, this should be equal to one plus i 12 all over 12, but generally speaking, it doesn't have to be 12. We can compound you know, quarterly or um, triannually or what have you, so that can be, for example, to the power of n and also to the power of m. So how can we convert from 
this annual effective interest rate into this nominal interest rate convertible. And again, let's sort of summarize that. So I is our annual effective interest rate, annual effective interest rate, because that is our, gonna be our alpha. And then we have our IN, and that's going to be our annual or nominal, we'll stay consistent, nominal interest rate convertible. Right? So how can we convert between one and the other? So obviously this power of one isn't going to really change anything for us, and then we can subtract one from both sides of this expression. So we clearly see that our annual effective interest rate is just gonna be equal to one plus i n over n to the power of n minus one. Right? So that's how you can convert from your nominal interest rate convertible to an annual effective interest rate. So how can I solve this instead for I n? So if I want to solve this for I n, how would I do it? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write this again. So one plus I will be equal to one plus I n over n to the power of m. The first thing that we need to do is get rid of that n. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide in terms of powers both sides by n, which is equivalent to taking the nth root of both sides. So once I have that, I'm going to have one plus I to the power of one over n is equal to one plus i n all over n. Now I need to subtract this one from both sides to get rid of it, and then multiply both sides by n to get our i n by itself. So once I have that, I'm going to have i n, our convertible interest rate, will be equal to n multiplied by one plus i to the power of one over n minus one. And we also have our original or our reverse formula, which is just gonna be equal to one plus i n all over n to the power of n minus one, right? So that's how you can convert between nominal interest rate convertibles and also annual effective interest rates. So what do we have here? So we have these two particular relations and we have those other things, in particular alpha, our accumulation factor is equal to one plus our effective interest rate. We have our discount factor, which is v uh, nu is equal to one over one plus i. And now we have our convertible interest rate, which is gonna be equal to m times one plus i to the power of one over n minus one. So here I'm referencing everything with respect to um, the effective interest rates. So is it possible that I can discount just like I did with one plus i? Because notice that this is gonna be alpha to the power of one over n. Is it possible that I can discount compoundedly like I did with alphas? And the answer is of course yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and build a similar uh, financial structure similar to that of alpha. So Sn, keep in mind, was equal to S0 times one plus i to the power of m. And again, this i is our effective interest rate. Uh, usually by default, that's usually gonna be an annual effective interest rate. So what I want to do is I want to go backwards. So I want to go from S0 to Sn, or S and S, zero depending on how you look at it. And I'm going to look at another interest rate and I'm going to look at this as D. Right, so the question now becomes what is this D? So this D, we're going to call it an effective, you wanna take a guess of what this is called? This is gonna be an effective discount rate. Right, so just like effective interest rates are gonna move things in the future, um, effective discount rates are going to move things back into the past. Right? So this is gonna be sort of like a relationship between alpha and u, and that's gonna be sort of an analogous, analogous relationship between i and d. So if we look at it from that particular angle, and since the math is usually a little bit more nicer to deal with, so S0 will be equal to Sn, so we're going from uh, Sn to S0, so we're moving things into the past, that's gonna be a discount factor to the power of m. What are we going to have? So if we look at these particular structures, what we have here is nu and one minus d are precisely equal to the same exact thing. So that means nu will be equal to one minus the effective discount rate. 
So what exactly is nu? Well, nu is the reciprocal of one plus i. So we can solve this particular equation for d and we can have a connection between d and i. Right. So I can subtract both sides by one. So I'm going to have minus d will be equal to one over one plus i minus one. And then I can get a common denominator of one plus i and then do some simplification. So we're gonna have one minus one plus i all over one plus i. Distribute your one, cancel your ones, and you're going to have um, that minus i on top. Right, so once you have that, you're gonna have what? So you're gonna have minus d will be equal to minus i all over one plus i, and then you can multiply both sides by minus one to eliminate that negative on both sides. And then you have that the effective discount rate is just equal to the effective interest rate all over the accumulation factor one plus i. Right? So that's how you can convert between those two objects. And you can see that, okay, well, I can also write one plus i as alpha, so that means that d also can be rewritten as i over alpha, or equivalently, i times nu anyway is perfectly okay, depending on what you're trying to work with and how you're trying to work with it. Right? So now we have this effective discount rate. We also had our nominal interest rate convertible, is it possible that we can make maybe a nominal discount rate convertible? Um, sort of like our i to the power of n, maybe we can have a d to the power of n as well, um, so that we can compound uh, you know, discreetly into the past in time if we wanted to do so. Um, and that's perfectly okay, we can build such structures, and how would we go about doing so? So if s1 will be equal to s0, so 1 is going to correspond to a year. Okay, and we're going to compound across that year n times. So that's going to be s0 times 1 plus i to the power of n over n to the power of n. Right? So that's just a compounding of i n times. So what I want to do is I want to solve this equation for s0. So how am I going to do that? So I'm just going to divide both sides by this parenthetical term, right? which is the same as multiplying both sides by negative exponents, if you will. So I can write this as s0 is equal to s1 times 1 plus i to the power of n all over n to the power of minus n. Right? So we have that particular expression. So if we want to create a new structure that does not have i to the power of n, what we want to do is define it in a way, so we're going to denote s0 to be equal to s1, and then we're going to probably have it as 1 minus d to the power of n all over m, and since we want to move things back in time n times, we want that to be equal to, uh, to the power of m. Okay, so this is what we would like to see in terms of this particular structure. Right? But keep in mind, since we're only moving things back one time, Right? If we're going, for example, from S1 to S0, that's just one reverse accumulation factor or one discount factor. So that's just going to be equal to S1 times nu because that's another way of getting to S0. So now if we look at these two equations side by side, what we have here is 1 minus d to the power of n all over n to the n will just be equal to our discount uh, rate new. Right? So that's actually pretty nice. And keep in mind new is just the same thing as 1 over 1 plus i. So let's see if we can write these in terms of each other. So let's see if we can solve this equation for dn and write it in terms of i. So how am I going to do that? So the first thing I'm going to get rid of is this particular power of n. So I'm just going to divide both sides by that power of m. And that's going to give us what? So I'm going to have 1 minus dn over m, and that's going to be equal to 1 plus i to the power of minus 1 over m. Now I'm going to subtract both sides by 1, and that's going to give me minus dn over n is equal to 1. Actually, what I want to do is I want to subtract it in the front. You'll see why I want to do this in a second. So minus 1 plus 1 plus i to the power of minus 1 over m. And then I want to multiply both sides of this equation by minus 1. So that's going to change those two signs and negate the left-hand side. Then multiply both sides by n, and that's going to give us the statement that you would like. So dm will be equal to n times 1 minus 1 plus i to the power of 
negative 1 over n. Right? So this gives us our particular structure that we're interested in finding. And this is sometimes referred to as the nominal discount rate convertible, which is analogous to the nominal interest rate convertible, i to the power of m. So we have several different types of interest rate forms that we've discussed so far. So let's go ahead and sort of summarize them into one nice little table. And for all of the, com the comparison interest rate forms, let's write them all in terms of the annual effective interest rates. But you could technically rearrange all these formulas into any of the others by just sort of connecting the two in an algebraic puzzle, if you may. So let's assume I corresponds to your annual effective interest rate. So we have alpha, which is 1 plus i, and we have nu, which is equal to 1 over 1 plus i. So what are these? So alpha is our accumulation, accumulation factor. We have nu, which is our discount factor. And now we have our i n and also our d n. So i, n, and d, n, so what were these? So i, n came out to n times one plus our effective interest rate to the power of one over m minus one, and d, n came out to n times, and it kind of sort of mirrors backwards, so one minus one plus i to the power of negative one over m. So what were these particular objects? So i, n was our nominal, so our nominal interest rate, and sometimes you can drop this nominal because it's kind of implied. So our nominal interest rate convertible, and this one would be our nominal discount rate convertible. Right. And those four particular things are um, definitely very important. And also let's introduce our other metric that we introduced, so D. So D came out to i over 1 plus i, and who is this important character? That is our effective discount rate. All right. Now there's one other interest rate form that is definitely uh, important, and it's again connected to our compounding interest idea, but it's when you want to compound continuously, because you know a couple of strange things happen in terms of the math. So let's sort of go back to sort of look at that and what that looked like. So let's assume we want to go to one year, and let's assume that we want to compound uh, i n times over the course of a year. And let's assume that we want to take n and send it to infinity. So what we're actually going to get, keep in mind, and this is going to come out to s0 times e to the power of i infinity infinity um, times t, because technically there should be a t. If we replace t with 1, then there's a t there, right? But what is this particular object here, i to the infinity? Because if you look at our particular form uh, for our expression, i n, um, you're going to have an infinity times something, um, which isn't really going to make any sense. Right? So this particular object, i infinity, we're going to actually be going to be calling this a different structure. So let's go back to our s1 form. So s1 will be equal to s0 times e to the i infinity. We're going to be calling this s0 times e to the delta. Right? So this particular object, this is lowercase Greek letter delta. Right? So this delta has a name. Delta is called the force of interest, the force of interest, which kind of mimics that idea of compounding continuously. That's pretty much the driving force or the cap or the upper bound in terms of the amount of money that you can make on a transaction per instant of time. Right? So if we look at our particular structure, how can we relate this delta to our i's? So again, s1 will be equal to s0 times alpha 
which is just going to be S0 times 1 plus i. And S1, let's assume our compounding under continuous compoundings, is going to be equal to S0 times e to the power of delta. So all we really need to do is just solve this equation for delta to sort of relate these two objects together. So we clearly see that S0 is on both sides of this equation, so we get the very nice equation 1 plus i, or alpha, is equal to e to the delta. Right? So you can either solve this equation for i or you can solve it for delta. Either one is perfectly okay. So if we solve this for i by subtracting both sides by 1, um, i will just be equal to e to the delta, e to the delta minus 1. So that's how we can solve for i. Or we can solve for delta by taking the natural logarithm of both sides. Right? So we can say that the force of interest will be equal to the natural log of 1 plus the effective interest rate, or just equivalently the natural log of the periodic accumulation factor alpha. Right? Now let us look at a particular word problem that sort of demonstrates how we can use this force of interest delta. Suppose that you have invested an amount of $5,000 that earns interest continuously at a constant force of interest of 4-3% per annum, or per year. What is the value of the investment after two years? Right? So a couple things that are very useful to spectate here. Notice that we're accumulating interest continuously, but we don't have the annual interest rate given to us. If we did, we would have to compound that continuously, take the limit as n goes to infinity, and get our e to the rt structure. But notice that we have given our constant, that is, it's not a variable force of interest rate, but it's a constant force of interest rate of 4.3%. Right? So that already has that continuous compoundings taken into account for us. Right? So what is the value of the investment after two years? Right? So how would we do that? So if we want to solve this using the structures that we've already built, so S1 will be equal to S0 times e to the power of delta. And if we want to go two years, that's just going to be equal to S, S2 is going to be equal to S0 times e to the delta times 2. Right? So once we have that, and keep in mind, this is also equivalent to S0 times e to the delta squared, because when you have a power to a power, you multiply. Because uh, keep in mind, 3 squared to the power of 4 is the same as 3 to the power of 2 times 4, which is the same as 3 to the power of 8. Right? So those particular things are equivalent to each other. Right? But I just also want to mention, in case you aren't sure, that this is not the same as S0 times e to the delta squared, where 2 is applied to the delta and then to the e. Right? So those things are not equal to each other, so be very careful about that. Right? So once we have that particular structure, what do we have? So after two years, that's going to be equal to our principal, 5,000, and then that's going to be e to the power of delta, 0.043, our force of interest. And then once we square that and then multiply that by 5,000, that's going to be approximately $5,449.03. So that's going to be the value of our investment after two years under that particular force of interest, delta. Right? So in this video, we looked at several different ways of representing the interest um, that are taken from completely different viewpoints, rates, and perspectives in time, both in the future and also in the present. Now, in the upcoming videos, we're going to be looking at several different um, applications of each of these investment rate structures at different points in time and sort of see how they interact with each other and why some are more useful in some certain pricing scenarios compared to others. So I hope to see you in those future videos, and I hope you enjoyed this one in particular. See you in the future. Thank you. Bye.